Hey everyone, Evan Dameril here, co-host of Locked On Cavs. I am a part of the Locked On NBA Roundtable, where we talk about some of the contenders in this year's Eastern Conference, which surprisingly includes our Cleveland Cavaliers. Get ready to check this out, and Chris and I will be back later this week with more Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs. Your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to a Locked On Podcast Network special, the top of the Eastern Conference roundtable. I'm Wes Goldberg from Locked On Heat, joined by our hosts covering the Bulls, Sixers, Cavs, and Bucks. We've got Evan Damarell from Locked On Cavaliers, Matt Peck from Locked On Bulls, Kane Pittman from Locked On Bucks, uh, and we've got a lot to get into. So let's just jump right in, fellas, with what happened at the trade deadline. Uh, do any of the changes at the deadline affect the landscape of the Eastern Conference or how you view the playoffs? Uh, I'm going to open it up uh, to number two in the Eastern Conference, not number one just yet, Matt Peck. What do you think, Matt? Well, we're not calling it a tie for first at the All-Star break, really? That's yep. how we're playing this? That's how we're doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the Harden-Simmons swap, I think it's very hard to know the answer to that right now. If anybody is trying to tell you right now they, they know the answer of what that trade does in the East, they're lying. Um, or, or at the very best, pontificating. I think that Brooklyn got the better side of that, assuming Simmons is mentally ready to play and physically ready to play. Um, Obviously people talking about Harden and Embiid being like an amazing, unstoppable, you know, one, two combo. I'm just looking over the track record of James Harden's NBA history and trying to play with a bunch of different stars of a bunch of different types of basketball skill sets and failing to make it work with all of them. People saying that you can't waste this MVP caliber season for Embiid. So let's, you know, fix the Simmons problem and get him another like top tier star to play with. I'm not convinced that Harden is the right answer for that guy. I I, like I'm sitting here kind of hoping that we get to see all of that blow up because James Harden has a tendency to make things blow up. Um, But I still right now, despite the fact that they're all the way down at eighth, would not count out the Brooklyn Nets. Can I want to go to you representing the Milwaukee Bucks here going into the season, the path out of the East always went through Milwaukee, right? Obviously the defending champs. Based on where the Sixers and the Nets were to begin the season and all the changes that happened at the deadline, where they are now, and where the Bucks are now, and we'll jump more in specific, uh, into the specifics about the Bucks a little bit later, but how do you view that competition just between what the, where the Bucks are at and, and what, what has happened in Philadelphia and in Brooklyn? Well, it was my thought that all the other contending teams in the East, if you're a fan of those teams, you should have been hoping that no trade happened because I thought mm. that if nothing went down, then there was uh, the Sixers were uh, the Sixers' chances were lower than if they were able to trade for another star and get more help for Joel Embiid. And on the Nets side, I think there was more chance of something just completely blowing up. I mean, we know that it's not trending in a good direction. So I kind of I kind of disagree with Matt a little bit, particularly with the James Harden stuff because. I, yeah, if you look at the track record and say, okay, well, he hasn't won a title, that's fine. But I, I actually think that his track record in the early days with new partnerships is always pretty good. So what do I think about the Philadelphia 76ers long term? I'm not 100% sure, but he had early success with Chris Paul. He, I mean, the Nets were really damn good last year. And if he didn't uh, hurt his hamstring, then they might have won the whole title. And so I, I do think that generally he's happy to start. So he's going to be happy. So he's going to be motivated again. Now, is he going to start crying again in the offseason and decide that he doesn't want to be in Philadelphia and he doesn't want to play with Joel Embiid? Probably. That's, I mean, that's the track record. But certainly to start, I think the Sixers are far better. I think that now they're actually a team that could win the title. I didn't think they were a team that could win the title beforehand. So I think for the other teams in the East, it just got more difficult. Now, Evan, I want to go to you, too, now, because your Cavaliers are the surprise of this group, right? We're not talking to a host from the Brooklyn Nets. We're talking to a host from the Cleveland Caval- <laughs> the Locked On Cavaliers. So, um, look, I think that these next 20-plus games are so important, specifically now after those deadline deals were made, because we have a ramp-up 
in chemistry between James Harden and Joel Embiid. How does that look? They don't have that much time. Um, and we also have the, the, the burgeoning chemistry happening in Brooklyn and what happens there. But also, you've got teams like, like Brooklyn and the Sixers who might aim to try to raise up the standings here. And, you know, the Cavaliers, again, they were sort of the surprise here. How, what's your take? Is it, is it a little bit more of a precarious position at the top of the East here because of what happened with these deals? I jokingly said at the top that uh, I never doubted them. Well, um, that's that I'm happy to be here, but you know, I never doubted the Cavs for a second. <laughs> Let's just be frank here. Uh, you know, historically have been always great without LeBron James on the roster. And to Kane's point, when James Harden gets fed up in a situation in Philly, he can join LeBron in Cleveland next season as well. Just, you know, mm. speculation aside, but I think this does make things precarious, especially the Harden trade to Kane's point. If a major power shift like that in Philly didn't happen, like you said, that they need time to build chemistry and a little bit of a rapport with each other in terms of Embiid and Harden. So do Simmons, Durant, Irving, when he's part-time available and everything else is just tough. But Cleveland still has to play Philadelphia three more times this season. And they had two pretty ugly losses leading into the All-Star break to Philly and Atlanta. And I asked J.B. Bickerstaff about that, and he didn't think the team was hitting a collective wall just because they're young and kind of playing balls to the wall for every four, all 48 minutes of every single game. He just said it was just Embiid and Trey Young being two great players, and that's what they needed to beat Cleveland. But I think at this point, it, it's going to be a little bit more of a tightly contested race. I think, in my opinion, at least Miami and Chicago have really separated themselves from the pack just in terms of just overall record. And I think it's going to be a lot of jockeying between Cleveland, Philadelphia. I think Boston should be in the conversation as well. They're one of the hottest teams in the East right now. I think Brooklyn did get better by adding Ben Simmons because they have a player who is just vaccinated and more available when he's mentally ready to play. Um, and, and Cleveland, they got Karis LeVert, which helps a lot in terms of scoring punch off the bench and maybe in the starting lineup eventually once he gets more acclimated with Cle with what the Cavs are trying to do. And I I'm not just – it's surprising for sure. Like, I'm, I'm happy to be here, like I said. I think I'm happy to cover this team this season because they're fun, young, and just there's not really any certainty on what their ceiling and what their limit exactly is right now. And they could end up hosting a first-round playoff series and flaming out in spectacular fashion, or they could be a little bit of a – problem child as well because they do have some quality wins over milwaukee and over brooklyn when they had harden and durant and not irving at the time but when irving was kind of available too so it's interesting to think where the Cavs kind of stand in all of this but it's going to be a tightly contested race with about 20 or so games to go is there anything else you could tell us about the cavaliers and how exactly they got here i i really think it's just everything hitting right at the same time. Darius Garland took his expected leap into superstardom. I didn't think anyone quite saw this type of growth from him. I think people expected him to kind of take that next step and take the reins of this team. I think it's Jared Allen showing that he's more than the player he was when he signed that contract extension. I think it's Evan Mobley showing that he's more NBA ready than people gave him credit for heading into his rookie season. And I also think it's J.B. Bickerstaff just having his finger on the pulse of this team and He's arguably the coach of the year. You can make a case for Jenkins and well in Memphis, but and even Spolster in Miami too. But just the expectations were so low for this Cavs team that just based on historically, you know, without LeBron on the roster, they've never made the playoffs under Dan Gilbert's ownership, which is a wild statistic to think about. And they haven't made a playoffs without LeBron since 1997. So even crazier to think about too. It's just a lot of things are just hitting right for them at the same time. And I think Bickerstaff having his finger on the poles of this team being an unapologetically himself and like sticking to playing a big lineup. Like no one saw him playing Larry Markin as the starting three for the Cavs and it kind of working for them a little bit. Um, it, it isn't just a fun offensive wrinkle they're exploring. Like when they played Larry Nance Jr. at the three, it's something they're sticking to permanently and there's something they're trying to do long-term and it, it's working for the most part. We'll see if it sustains down the stretch and maybe into the playoffs as well, but it's just it, they're the most exciting story this season and I can't quite put my finger on it but it's just a mixture of everything hitting at the same exact time well it's like I always say Dragon Bender walked so that Larry Markinen could run right so um all jokes aside we don't we're not joined by Keith Pompey of Locked On Sixers here he wasn't able to make it but just to maybe have a voice in the room that's a little pro Sixers right now I guess that'll be my job here I think that you know, because everybody here on this uh, on this podcast, we do a, we do daily shows on the NBA. We are NBA geeks. We we think about this stuff. We analyze it. I think we overthink it. I think we overanalyze it. And and speaking of overthinking, I think some of this stuff is kind of pretty simple sometimes. 
The Sixers are maybe the only team in the Eastern Conference with two top 10 players on their roster. And Joel Embiid might be the best player in the NBA this year with the way he's playing. And with those two guys, I know there's some fit concerns. There's some James Harden attitude stuff. All this, all the noise. You you lose some good shooters in the trade and things like that. But, boy, if those guys are going full tilt and everything's copacetic for a little while, that's a really tough team to beat. Uh, they don't have the 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 upward the uphill climb in the standings the way that Brooklyn does, right? The Sixers are right there with all these other teams that we're talking about. That's why we're talking about them in in the top of the Eastern Conference roundtable here. But um, I kind of think they're the favorites in the Eastern Conference now. And maybe I should be more pro Bucks because they're the defending champs. Maybe I should be more pro Miami Heat because that's the team I cover and they're number one in the Eastern Conference and they look really really great. But they don't have two players at that level the way that the Sixers do. And I don't think any team in the Eastern Conference, that includes Brooklyn, by the way, has two players at the level of Joel Embiid and James Harden. Does anybody disagree or feel very strongly that they want to agree? I'll go with that. I actually disagree. I think Milwaukee is the best team in the East. I think it's going to be Milwaukee-Phoenix again in the finals, but I think Phoenix is going to get their revenge on Milwaukee. It's just... I'm not going to discredit them because I just feel like they now know how to win. Mike Budenholzer can kind of throw those jokes to the wayside and say that he doesn't know how to win in the playoffs. He knows how to make adjustments finally. And Giannis is the best player in the world, in my opinion. Like I'm sure Nick Dangstat, who is going to be editing this, might disagree with Luca being up there. But I just really do think the Bucks, being the defending champs, need a little bit more respect. And I'm curious what they do in the buyout market as well if maybe they make some more moves as well i think the Bembry signing is great for them but i am curious to see what they do and i'm just gonna wait until milwaukee's the throne to really say okay there's another clear favorite in the eastern conference okay well everyone's waiting for that this has been the weirdest thing about covering this team this season is all of a sudden no one's worried about the bucks and really if you look at this team play it hasn't been a great season the defense has not been great we know why they've had brooke lopez on the sidelines uh, all season long and that is the big question mark for this team i don't think the bucks can win the title if brooke lopez doesn't come back and isn't healthy mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think they can do it i think it's too hard in the eastern conference but just no one seems to be worried about the fact that it's been a pretty mediocre season because they've seen what they did last year from the third seed that this is a more difficult Eastern Conference. So particularly the defensive end, they have to figure some things out. They made the trade to try and acquire Serge Ibaka as, I don't think a Brook Lopez replacement, but a Brook Lopez insurance for a guy that can maybe split some time there, start if he needs to. I'm not sure that that's the move that's going to take them over the top. But yeah, I think what Evan said is just funny because that's what I've been talking about all season. Everyone's talking about all these other teams and they're like, ah, oh, the Bucks will figure it out. This time last year, the Bucs can't win because they can't do it in the playoffs. They're not a team that Giannis can't perform in the playoffs. Now everyone just assumes they're going to figure it out. So it's really interesting. It is. Um, Well, next, I want to talk about maybe the most overlooked team in all the NBA, the Miami Heat. Uh, But first, we got to talk about our friends (laughs) over at Prize Picks. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's daily fantasy made easy, and easy is really what they are all about. As fantasy props and pickums gets more popular, Prize Picks is making it easy for you to get involved. They do that with the best NBA DFS prop game on the market, offering more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator. This includes the Prize Picks power play. Here's how it works: predict the over under on any player's fantasy production, and you can win up to 10x on any entry. And that's just you versus the projected fantasy totals. If you're a total NBA, NBA junkie prize picks even allows mixed uh, team entries. For example, you could take the over on LeBron's fantasy score combined with the under on Nikola Jokic's score in the same entry. For a limited time, prize picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our users. Users get $50 for free if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point but you have to use that code NBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer available to locked on fans. Sign up today and use the promo code NBA for a $50 free uh, entry if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point. Do it all using the award-winning app on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Plus, prize picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals. So don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com. Use that promo code NBA or go to your app store and download the app today. It's prize picks daily fantasy made easy. All right, we are back with our Eastern Conference Roundtable, top of the Eastern Conference Roundtable. None of those bottom dwellers here. 
Um, and I want the opposite of a bottom dweller are the Miami Heat right now, the only team in the East in the top 10 in offensive and defensive rating. Um, yet not a whole lot of people have been talking about them as legit title contenders. And I'm not going to come on here, guys, and go total locked on heat soapbox here. I get why people have been not really looking at them because Bam Adebayo missed 22 games. Uh, a lot of their top players have been in and out of the lineup. It's really cool that they're number one in the East. It's a dope job by Eric Spolstra to kind of turn Max Struess and Caleb Martin and Gabe Vincent and all these guys nobody's ever heard of into a team that could stay at the top of a, a really competitive Eastern Conference. But this is what I've been saying about the Heat all along. I think they have the highest floor in the NBA. I think that much has been proven because they've been winning a bunch of games with their 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th guys. I don't think that's even really debatable. But nobody has any idea what their ceiling is. We have no idea because that group, their top five players, I would argue, are Kyle Lowry, uh, Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler, P.J. Tucker, Bam Adebayo, uh, in no particular order, obviously. But that group has only played like 60 minutes total together all season long. We have no idea outside of those 60 minutes, and they haven't, even, they haven't had a, pl- a positive net rating in those minutes. We have no idea what the best version of this team looks like. And so I understand why they're a little confusing. And when things are confusing, people tend not to talk about it. But with that in mind, let's talk about it. Uh, What has to go right for Miami to win a title? Do we think that Miami can win a title? Matt, what do you think? No, I don't. Uh, Sorry to to burst your bubble so abruptly like that. Um, I think the NBA is about, yes, role players and you're right I think Eric Spolstra per usual has done a phenomenal job getting a lot out of players you wouldn't necessarily expect him to get a lot out of this season but at the you know at the crux of it and winning an NBA championship you need to have the best superstar player that is why the Bucks finally got over the mountaintop last season because Giannis was the best player in the NBA no offense to Jimmy Buckets you know he had some good times over here in Chicago but He's, he's not the best player in any series against any of these other top contenders in the East. He's just not. Uh, maybe, maybe you disagree with that, but from my perspective, you need to have the best player in the series to win conference finals, NBA finals, and as much tinkering as Eric Spolster can do and as much grittiness that they can get out of that Heat squad, I, that, that is what I see as their roadblock. They will not have the best player in any series against the other contenders in the East. I don't disagree with that uh, unless Jimmy Butler is at like NBA playoff bubble Jimmy Butler because that Jimmy Butler was the best player on the court against Milwaukee. He was the best player on the court uh, against Boston, but I don't know. That was an, an all time type of performance. We don't, and that was a very strange atmosphere and it seems like he actually got better by the bubble or within the bubble than he was out of the bubble. So I don't know. I, I don't know if you, you need another bubble for Jimmy Butler, but um uh, to that point, I do I do mostly agree with you. I just I guess my biggest question is, uh, is the balance enough? Right? Is this 2014 Spurs? Is this 2011 Mavericks? Like, is the balance on both sides of the ball going to be enough? Because every once in a while, we see a team that has enough on both sides, and it's they just sort of are able to to balance their way to a win uh, to a finals at least appearance and. You know, for the Heat, they are the most balanced team in the Eastern Conference. We mentioned the 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 uh, the Bucks, the defensive issues they have there, the stuff that we were talking about with Philly and Brooklyn. Um, Kane, what do you think? Are, are we discounting Miami? What what has to go right for them? Uh, I don't think anyone's discounting them. I think it's about right. I mean, they're going to be an excellent defensive team. Everyone knows that. So in the playoffs, they are going to be a chance to win these scrappy games, ninety three to eighty seven, and I think that's their path to the championship because offensively. I don't see that they've got a guy in the fourth quarter that's, that other teams are going to be terrified about, to Matt's point. Because Jimmy Butler probably has to be the guy. And you mentioned his run in the bubble. It's kind of similar to Anthony Davis. You look, you look at Anthony Davis, those numbers in the bubble, and you say, what? Well, who was that guy that was playing for the Lakers in the bubble uh, during that championship run? But then we saw Jimmy Butler last year, who was absolutely awful in the, in the first round against the Bucs, and it was only four games. So it's a, obviously a super small sample size. But I think he's got a lot to prove. But I think you're right in terms of the Heat having a a high floor. I I think it was very predictable that this team was going to be really, really good in the regular season because they simply try harder than most most teams. Uh, When you guys beat the Bucs earlier in the season, I said, well, the the Heat culture, it's the Miami tryhards. And I don't mean that in, in a way that should be offensive. But when you go up against all these guys, they don't know how to play any other way on a night to night basis in the regular season. You're going to pile up wins. So they're a really good team. 
They're going to be hard to play against. I probably don't have them in the top couple of contenders uh, for as far as a, a championship goes, though. Yeah, I think the playing hard thing become, is a huge advantage in the regular season. It becomes less of an advantage in the postseason, right? Mm-hmm. Because ostensibly, yeah. you would imagine all those teams are are playing hard. Matt, I want to go back to you uh, talking about the Bulls. Here are their championship odds uh, via bet online. They are lower than the Jazz and Celtics. Um, you look at these championship odds, the Suns plus 425. The Warriors plus 450, the Nets plus 600, Milwaukee plus 600, Philadelphia plus 700, Miami plus 1200, Utah plus 1600, Boston plus 2200, Chicago all the way down there at plus 2800. Like, is now the time to just put the mortgage on the Chicago Bulls? Like, why are they being so overlooked here? I think it's a variety of reasons. Um, First and foremost, if you look at their records against not only the other top teams in the East, the other seven teams in the East that are one through eight outside of Chicago, the Bulls are six and 10 against those teams. If you take the other top four teams in the East next to Chicago and the top four teams in the West, I believe they're two and 11 against those teams collectively so far this season. I think also a lot of people as fun and amazing and unpredictable as this season from DeMar DeRozan has been, uh, people don't see DeMar and Zach Levine as a good enough duo to win an NBA championship. There's also the, you know, the, the aspect of, like you said, with Miami, not really knowing what this team looks like and the fact that they've been shorthanded pretty much out of the gate. Patrick Williams, their starting power forward, went down in game five. And then we've also dealt with injuries sporadically to Zach, to DeMar, uh, to Vooch, Caruso and Lonzo Ball, who are both out right now. Um, so th- the main five for the Bulls will be uh, closing games once they come back probably because Billy likes to go small, Alex Caruso, Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, Nikola Vucevic. We've only seen around 100 or so minutes from that five spanning 15 or so games because that's only the times that they've been available this season. But that five on the floor have a 12 plus 12 and a half net rating together. So again, it's kind of like Miami in that when this Bulls team has been whole this season, they've been good and not just getting buckets. Everybody was wondering, well, yeah, they're going to score points, but can they stop anybody? With Caruso and Lonzo's point of attack defense when they were healthy, the Bulls' defense was respectable, maybe even above respectable. But because they you know, haven't been out and because the Bulls have been losing to other top teams, primarily nationally televised games, I don't know if you guys noticed, but when the Bulls are on national TV this season, they've been playing like crap. So there you go. There, there are the odds explained for you. Uh, getting Patrick Williams, Caruso, Lonzo Ball, like that group back, obviously Chicago is an awesome offensive team. Is that enough balance uh, on the defensive side of the ball, do you think? I think we're going to find out. Um, again, like before all of these guys went down, the Bulls had at right out of the gate this season for a while, they were a top five defense. And then even before Lonzo and Caruso got hurt, they were, you know, right on the fringe of being a top 10 defense all the while having the fourth best offense in the NBA. So you, you can get away with a, a deep playoff run and even win an NBA championship with an elite offense and an okay defense. Uh, you know, the, the opposite is not true in the NBA anymore, at least in my opinion. So if the Bulls with Caruso and Lonzo and Patrick Williams all hopefully returning sometime mid-March, maybe at, at the very least a few handful of regular season games under their vault before the playoffs hit, and turn their defense back into at least a respectable defense, then yeah, they might be able to make some noise and and make it to the conference finals. So as we say here, coming out of the all-star break, uh, Cleveland, two and a half games back, find the one seed Milwaukee, two and a half games back, Brooklyn, still seven games back. Uh, I'm going to do some quick math here. That's four and a half games back of Cleveland and Milwaukee. If I have that right. Um, Evan, I want to go to you here. I want and loop back to Brooklyn. What do you need to see from the nets? coming out of the all-star break for you to officially be a little worried about holding on to a chance for maybe home court advantage in, in the first round here in the playoffs. It's really how available Ben Simmons is and how Steve Nash utilizes him. I I thought about this a little bit, but if, if the nets want to use Ben Simmons as like a point center scenario and they run out of lineup that features Irving Durant, uh, Simmons, Curry, and, you could probably throw in a wild card player, just maybe Joe Harris if he's healthy and available as well. Like that's a pretty scary lineup to go up against, especially in the half court and especially in a playoff scenario. And uh, yeah, that's just what I really think about when it comes to Brooklyn. It's because they played them a few times already this year. I think they're done playing Brooklyn this year. They have one more game left on their docket off the top of my head. 
but I think the Cavs will get a good test of what they really have there. I mean, they have former Cavs legend Andre Drummond on the roster as well, which really just opens things up for them too. But um, it, I, I'm just curious to see what happens. And I just think more than anything, I just really think Philadelphia and having to play them three more times this season is going to be the bigger nip in the bud for the Cavs just heading into this playoff scenario. Because again, we didn't expect them to be here at this point, but they're going to be jockeying and positioning and like these games, like the two wins they got over Milwaukee this season will be important, but the Bucks could always flip another switch as well. Like to Kane's point, defensively without Lopez, there are some concerns and adding a Baca to the fold does address the issues a little bit, but it doesn't obviously completely fix what's wrong with this, with Milwaukee on defense, but there's a lot of variables here in play. And I just wonder if Cleveland's youth and and experience is going to come back to haunt them a little bit too, especially when teams maybe start to gear up and start to take these last 20 or so games seriously. And you see Cavs just kind of getting dominated down the stretch. Yeah. I think when it comes down to Brooklyn, what I keep circling back to are just a lot of sort of, uh, best case scenario type of assumptions. Kyrie Irving will be able to play because something happens in New York City that allows him to play as far as a mandate is concerned. Kevin Durant comes back from this injury looking like Kevin Durant before the injury, which was an MVP number one player in the league player. Um, that Ben Simmons is over any of these sort of mental issues or anything else that we don't have a whole lot of insight to and that he's able to be a functional player in the postseason because he wasn't last season for Philadelphia. And we have to assume that that change of scenery is going to be enough to sort of unleash Ben Simmons in a positive way uh, that they stay healthy because there's not, it isn't a team with a whole lot of depth uh, despite the Goran Dragic thing and, and all of that. So um, I don't know, but like I said, these next 20 plus games are going to be really important, maybe for Brooklyn more than any other team to just sort of see what they've got going on. Uh, coming up next, we're going to go through our lightning round, starting with why each of our hosts think that the team they cover can win the Eastern conference. But first let's talk about our friends at bet online. Football might be over for the season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, news this season, and it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net has your, is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. It's BetOnline, where the game starts. Okay, we are back here with our top of the Eastern Conference Locked On Podcast Network roundtable, and we are entering the fun part of the show, the lightning round. Uh, We're going to go around with this first question uh, to all of our hosts. Why can your team win the East? Kane, I want to start with you. Why can the Bucs win the East? Well, Giannis, first of all, that's the easy answer if you just wanted one word. But I I think, honestly, it's also... Uh, the memory of last year, coming into last year's postseason, there was a lot of questions over how this team can respond when they're under pressure. How can they car- carry the playoff uh, pressure on their shoulders after having a number of good seasons? And they were losing 2-0 in two series. They didn't have home court advantage. They found their way through. So I think the memory of being able to dig themselves out of those holes uh, leaves them in good stead. Matt? DeMar DeRozan and Zach Levine are the league's leading scoring duo in the NBA at the All-Star break. DeMar DeRozan leads the NBA in fourth quarter bucket getting, baby. Evan? Uh, Youth and inexperience doesn't come back to bite the Cavs (laughs) whatsoever in this one. And maybe, just maybe, they are more the Atlanta Hawks than they are the New York Knicks in terms of just being tryhards. And if you want to draw parallels to last year's postseason. Uh, for the Heat, um, I think at the end of the day, we've seen a lot of these team, these players, their top players, perform at higher levels in the postseason. It's going to be a big Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo type postseason for them to get all the way through. And they are the most balanced team in the Eastern Conference. They don't have they're they're good on defense. Uh, they they manage to find points. They're opportunistic on offense, and they're not going to be out coached in any series with Eric Spolstra at the helm. Um, this next question: What's the biggest weakness for your team? Kane, we're back to you. Talk about the Bucks. Yeah, defense again. Uh, when you have Giannis uh, playing at the five, which is something we saw them do a little bit in the postseason, it, it can work. And I think that that's something that they will lean on. But ultimately, Brooke Lopez was the anchor and Giannis can then play off the ball a little bit. He can be uh, what he is, the best help defender in the NBA. So I think having Brooke Lopez back healthy is critical for this team. And if not, uh, there is a lot of leaning on Bobby Portis and... 
and Serge Ibaka, which is a little bit concerning on the defensive end, particularly if you are in a series against Joel Embiid. Matt, what's your biggest concern with Chicago? Well, because we already touched on the defense, I'll say bench production. Um, mm-hmm. Because the Bulls have been so thin this season, their bench has been getting worked and outscored in in huge numbers uh, most often. And then hopefully when these guys do come back, Bonzo, Caruso, et cetera, when guys like Io DeSumo and Kobe White, who have made incredible strides, filling much you know needed roles in the starting lineup, shift back to bench roles, can they make that adjustment successfully and give the Bulls solid minutes and production off of the bench because you need that in the playoffs. Evan, you already mentioned the inexperience, but anything else that worries you about the Cavs? Uh, it's a lack of three-point production for this team for sure, and maybe just maybe teams frustrating Darius Garland a little bit. I think you saw a really good case study of it when they played the Bucks and Drew Holiday kind of put Darius Garland in hell for the majority of the game, and he is the lead initiator of this offense for the Cavs. You can't ask Jared Allen and Evan Mobley to create offense for the rest of this team. And if you shut him down, you kind of shut down Cleveland offensively, and this isn't a good offensive team to begin with. They are probably the lower third of the league, I'd say, at this point. And you can't really grind out every single game and hope to win a seven-game series because teams will just make adjustments in trying to shut down what is hurting them, and what hurts most teams is Garland. Yeah, and for the Heat, I think it's just the half court offense. Uh, you got you have guys like Kyle, Jimmy, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo who thrive in transition. Jimmy Butler can also get you a bucket in the half court, but we're talking about long twos and, and maybe some and, and getting to the free throw line. And Duncan Robinson is kind of the guy that unlocks the entire half court offense with those dribble handoffs with Bam and all that kind of stuff. But Duncan Robinson's been a little bit up and down uh, from a three point shooting perspective all season long. So can the Heat generate points in the half court when the game slows down? That's been an issue for them, especially against bigger teams this season. Uh, And that would be the big question for me for them going into the playoffs. Uh, Going back around with a new question, which other team in the East do we all think can join this group in the top four or five? Uh, in the final stretch of the regular season. Kane, back to you. Well, I think it is Brooklyn, but I don't think that they will get into the top four seeding before the playoffs. But in terms of teams that you don't want to play, uh, it's definitely the Nets. Uh, you asked a question earlier about why Brooklyn is scary or how can they move back in. Yes, the vaccine mandate is obviously number one or, or up there, but they have Kevin Durant. That's the most important thing for them. As long as he's healthy, the Bucs saw it firsthand last year. Everyone talks about P.J. Tucker. Durant still averaged 36 points on 50-40-90 shooting. I mean, it was absolutely insane, and he nearly carried this team himself. So it's the Nets, because I, don't I, don't, I wouldn't know a team that wants to face Kevin Durant in a first-round series. Well, because I don't know that anybody else is going to have a different answer, I think we're just going to get to our next question. Unless somebody wants to speak up for Charlotte or something like that. Evan, you've got you've got one. I, I think Boston is. I, I know people oh, fair talk enough. on what they are about. I think there are some questions about what Ime is doing. But the, like I said, they're one of the hottest teams in the East right now. And yeah, they lost to Detroit right before the All-Star break. But they're pretty hot right now. And I think they could climb their way into the top four. Toronto needs a little bit of love, too. I think what Nick Nurse is I was going to say, always, don't count out Toronto. Yeah, Toronto's. I think it's going to be a little tighter. I think you're going to see some of these teams who are in the playoff, or sorry, the play and hunt, kind of start nipping at the heels for some of the teams that are maybe at like that three, four, five spot. Matt, did you want to speak on Toronto or anybody else? Yeah, no, I mean, just that they've been playing really well lately. And, and as Kane was mentioning, certainly a team that nobody in, in the top of this picture wants to see in a first round playoff series is the Toronto Raptors. Um, but as far as anybody else making a jump, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, they are represented in this top of the East, but Milwaukee at five right now at the all-star break would not be surprised to see Milwaukee end up with one of the top two seeds. Well, Matt, you kind of hit on our next question. What is the team you don't want to see in the first round? Kane, we'll start with you with the Bucks. Well, we can mix it up then. Let's go Toronto. The Bucks have a lot of history with the Raptors. Uh, they have weird lineups where they can just play five guys switching all over the place. Those six, seven, six, eight guys that everyone's been talking about. And Nick Nurse is just kind of a genius. So uh, let's go with the Raptors. The Bucks have bad history with Fred Van Vliet. Now, I'm not sure whether he's going to have a kid around playoff time this year that seemed to set him off in 2019 and he started shooting 85% from three in the conference finals, but we'll see. But let's go with the Raptors. I don't think the Bucks would like to see Toronto in the first round. It would be challenging, but what, what first round series isn't going to be? I guess that's the, the bigger question. Well, I guess whoever plays Charlotte or Atlanta, I don't know. Atlanta is kind of weird. Uh, let, let's start with you, Matt, because you're going to be the, the Chicago Bulls. If they hang on to this number two seed, they're going to be looking to play the number eight seed right now that we're talking about a playing tournament between Charlotte 
and Atlanta. But if there is a first round opponent that the Bulls don't want to see, who would it be? Uh, you know, if the Bulls hang around, you know, one, two or three and Toronto stays somewhere six, seven or eight. I mean, ugh. but I mean, on, honestly, how is the answer anything other than you don't want to play Kevin Durant in the first right. round if you're the team <laughs> with home court advantage? Like that's I feel right. like you can't over and then you're guaranteed it. Kyrie gets to play in a game seven. Right. If it goes yeah. that far. Don't want any of that. I, the, the Bulls did go two and one against the Nets this season. Uh, and of course, one of those that was nationally televised, the Bulls got worked uh, by the the Nets old big three. Um, and I believe one of the th- the original big three were missing in each of those two wins for the Bulls. So I, I know that the Bulls can play even with Brooklyn and we don't know what they look like with Ben Simmons. But assuming Kevin Durant is healthy, you do not want to have to play Kevin Durant in the first round. <laughs> Uh, Evan, I think you're in an interesting spot here. The Cavaliers are four or five matchup. It could be you, your team versus Kane's team here. Uh, but what's the team you, you don't want to see in the first round? Like I said, I think the Cavs should just be happy to be here because <laughs> most of these teams, Cleveland probably wouldn't want to play in the first round. Charlotte and Atlanta, notwithstanding. I mean, they did yeah. just get molly whopped by Atlanta, but if you had to have you pinpoint specific teams, I think Milwaukee, just because Drew Holiday would give Darius Garland the fits. And I think Giannis just, being so big would be giving Evan Mobley and Jared Allen some problems. Philadelphia as well, if they happen to like slip for. Well, some can I can I five. reframe the question? Because oh, I think sure. you hit on something interesting there. Is there a team you would you would think that the Cavaliers would have an opportunity to upset? Like best chances at, at an upset? I think honestly, maybe Toronto or Boston, just in the grand scheme of things. I know I said Boston's a team to watch, but those are teams that Cleveland matches up better against because. You were talking about Miami making a case for them. Like the Cavs beat the Heat without Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo twice this season. They they ended a losing streak that is older than my life, I think, at this point, in terms of how last time they wanted Miami. And like I think Baker Staff would get out coached by Spolstra and Adebayo would give Allen or Mobley frustration. And then Jimmy Butler's just an X factor on defense as well. But teams that maybe not don't play as big maybe try to play a little smaller maybe chicago as well but chicago has worked the Cavs a little bit but it's been a fun series between those two but i i just like i said i think cleveland is just happy to be here to get the experience for the younger guys and they take the next step next season and we talk about how atlanta is a little weird and how new york's just completely out of the picture altogether you don't want to end up in the same position as them where you're a young team and then you fall flat on your face the following season. You want to build on the success and then maybe see what you have next season and the season after that. And then regarding the Heat, if they are if they manage to stay in this top three and they've got a pretty favorable schedule down the stretch, most of their games are going to be at home. It's a relatively easy schedule uh, for them. So there's a good chance that they hang in one of these top two, certainly one of these top three seeds, certainly have home court advantage uh, in the first round. But um, Toronto has played them very tough this year. Um, that's given some of their ball handler, that team, that length has given them fits, but I, I kind of keep just going back to, if it's Brooklyn, boy, you just, you're like, ah, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> that kind of sucks. Um, is, if no, if Boston drops down, if Cleveland drops down or anything like that, I'm not too worried about Miami and those matchups, but it would be Toronto. It's, it, and it would be Brooklyn that I think could be the biggest upset, um, potential there. Um, all right. Let's shift gears a little bit to the Western Conference uh, before we close up the roundtable here. Who do we think is going to come out of the West, right? Because the Phoenix Suns have a pretty substantial lead for that number one seed, but Chris Paul is going to be out six to eight weeks with this thumb injury. Golden State has looked a little shaky lately. We've got, obviously, some injury concerns uh, for Denver, for the Clippers, for the Lakers with this news about Anthony Davis right before the All-Star break and all this stuff. Who do we think is going to come out of the Western Conference? Um, Kane, we'll start with you. I think Phoenix, yeah, I think the, the Suns, for the most part, kind of, I guess it's kind of similar to the Bucks, where it doesn't feel like a lot of people are talking about them because it kind of just they're just really good. And the Suns are actually the team that are, that are dominating the regular season more so than the Bucks. But uh, I guess you lose the finals and, and you don't get the attention because you're not the new kids on the block anymore. But Phoenix are awesome. They're, they're good on both ends of the floor. I'm not so worried about Chris Paul. He's an old man. Give the man a rest before the playoffs. Let him fr- freshen up those legs. I think he'll be fine. The Suns have a huge lead at the top. I think Phoenix are really tough. Devin Booker agrees with you, by the way, Kane. He was like, this could be a blessing in disguise. He's going to be fresh for the playoffs. And last year, you know, in, in the years past for Chris Paul, it's been not being fresh for the playoffs. That has held him back and, and his chance to win the finals. Matt, what do you think? I, I can't not go with Golden State 
mm-hmm. assu- assuming that Draymond and Clay are both their normal selves. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's been nice to see Steph kind of take a step back a little bit and let Clay get as reacclimated as possible in a short amount of time after such a long absence. And, you know, we see Draymond in suits, you know, working for Turner Sports right now during the All-Star break, and people are wondering what he's going to look like when he comes back. But Draymond was playing phenomenal basketball earlier this season in that role that was crucial to that team winning three championships. And I know the two of those three came with Kevin Durant, who's not there anymore, but I still believe that, that trio of Steph, Clay, and Draymond, if they're healthy, plus these other complementary pieces they have with Wiggins, with Kaminga, um, you know, Wiseman could be another big X factor if he's back in the picture for a playoff run. Yes, Phoenix is playing great, but if it's those two in the conference finals, I don't care ha- who has home court. If if Golden State's healthy, I'm giving the edge to the three-time champs. Evan, is this where your PTSD over uh, those Golden State Warriors finals kicks in? Not necessarily. I um, I covered also this week, and a lot of folks were booing Steph and Draymond in force. But I, I've come to appreciate greatness, and I think <laughs> it's like watching Tom Brady just kick the teeth into your team for like your entire life. You just come to appreciate a great. I'm a Dolphins player. fan. I, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, outside of uh, LeBron coming out of the West and coming back to Cleveland next season, I think my pick is still going to be Phoenix. I agree with Kane's point. You give Chris Paul this time to rest. Maybe, hopefully, his hamstring is doesn't turn to dust from all the rust when he's in the first round but phoenix has just really just annihilated teams in the regular season and like kane said they've kind of flown under the radar a little bit i think golden state is a good pick as well um they know what it takes to win especially when you have steph draymond and clay just kind of acting as your veteran hub as your big three and just so many good young complimentary pieces i think they'd be a smart pick as well but i'm gonna go with phoenix just because they just seem to have that factor to them where I'm like, okay, this team could probably shred somebody in the playoffs and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't even bat an eye. Yeah. I think an underrated part of the golden state stuff and an underrated part of the TBS broadcaster in the all-star game was the fact that Draymond green was talking about his potential timetable. And he's like, I hope two to three weeks, but I have no idea. We'll see. And I'm paraphrasing here. There's no definitive timetable on Draymond and that's a back issue. And that stuff's weird. That stuff can get really weird. Uh, I'm, I, he was playing, he was probably defensive player of the year before he got hurt, but I don't know what he's going to look like when he comes back. If he does come back, we literally don't have any clue. The James Wiseman thing to me, a lot of Warriors fans, you see uh, like, oh yeah, just wait until we get Wiseman back. He's the answer for DeAndre Ayton. No, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> he's, he wasn't good before he got hurt and he's not going to be very good after he comes back. I, I, that's not your answer right now. Uh, I still have questions about Golden State, despite Steph and Clay. And, and maybe you're right, Matt. Maybe if it's a final series between the Phoenix Suns and the, and the Golden State Warriors, nobody's going to care about what the record is. Nobody's going to care. About, people are probably going to favor the Warriors. And and, and there, there is a cachet and there is a gravitas around that team, specifically around you know the the top three guys, Steph, Clay, and, and Draymond. But I can't shake Phoenix, man. That's a good team. Chris Paul might be slightly worse, and he might be banged up right now, but Devin Booker is way better. Mikhail Bridges is way better. DeAndre Ayton is legit. They're the most balanced team in the league. They have no weaknesses. I just I can't shake that team. I don't I mean, know. Campaign is still on that roster, right? You want to say no weaknesses? <laughs> So, okay. So Fair enough. that's that's my that's my Bulls fan self talk. <laughs> there you go. Somehow they turned campaign into an NBA player. I don't know how that happened. And Bismack Biombo. Credit to uh, Chris Paul. All right. I want to go quickly around with this last question. Just. Uh, just 10 seconds, 10 seconds. What team, let's assume the team you cover is in the NBA Finals. What team from the West do you not want to face? Kane. Uh, look, we're the champs, Wes. <laughs> we'll, we'll play anyone. I like the No conference. fear. But like let's say that, I mean, I, can I, I want to change this and say the team I want to play. If the Bucs are in there and I was covering the Finals, uh, let's go Phoenix. Let's do it again. Let's run it back. Ooh, I like it. Matt. I, if the Bulls make the finals, I do not want them to see Phoenix. I know I just said I'm taking the Warriors. <laughs> I do not want them to see Phoenix. That was it. You were talking with your you, you were talking with your heart there when you said the Warriors are the most uh, the best team to fear. Come on, <clears throat> Evan. Uh, like I said, the Cavs should be happy just to be here in general. <laughs> but if you had to tell me Phoenix, Golden State, I'd like them to see Memphis just as a basketball fan. I think that'd be fun to play. Yeah. I'm just we haven't talked about Memphis. Right now. Yeah. If things go the way they are currently standing, if the playoffs started today and somehow Portland snuck in and made it all the way to the NBA Finals somehow, <laughs> some way, that's the only matchup I'd say the Cavs are probably the overwhelming favorite. Uh, Justice Winslow has been playing really well for them. I don't know. That's going to be tough. Um, look, nobody wants to play Phoenix. I think that's an easy answer, but I don't think any. 
if it's those top two teams, you don't want to see either of them between Golden State and Phoenix. But uh, can we just quickly hear the Eastern Conference, no longer the Eastern Conference, right? We've got five teams that we're talking about, and we just mentioned Toronto and Boston and the Brooklyn that could sneak into this thing. Not the Eastern Conference anymore. Kind of feels like the Western Conference is the team that is the conference that's top heavy now. So there can't if any of these teams make it to the finals, there can't be any of that Eastern Conference crap anymore. This is a legit strong competitive conference, uh, harder to get through than I think the Western Conference at this point. Can we all just head nod and agree and fist bump and celebrate on that? <laughs> one through eight in the East is better than one through eight in the West, but the top two in the West are still the two best teams in the league. Yeah, okay, that's, that's your Golden State. Good. That's your Golden State love right there coming through. Uh, that's a wrap for us on the East. Eastern Conference Roundtable. Thanks to everybody who listened. Uh, Kane, Matt, Evan, thanks for jumping on. This was fun, guys.